Are you ready, Tudor? Yep. Uh, okay, uh, so we start, and I'm pleased to introduce Tudor Dimofta from UC Davis, who will speak I, I about... I actually, now... Ah, now yes, I mean, for the next five days. As, as, of, as of July 1st, actually. <laughs> ah, uh, uh, you no longer, okay, anyway. Uh, but, but both, but yeah. Both, so Edinburgh <laughs> and, and, and Davis, somewhere in between. Uh, but the most important part is the title of your talk, which is 3, 3D Mirror Symmetry and Homfle PT uh, Homology. Tudor, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jan. Um, th thanks for, for the invitation. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about some things that have been like, developed in, in little spurts over, over the last two years or so. Um, uh, so this is uh, joint work with, um, it's just not gonna be alphabetical. Um, so it's with uh, Lev Rosansky um, and Alexio Blomkoff, uh, Justin Hilburn, um, and Nicholas Garner. Um, and Nick Garner is a student at Davis who is about to graduate. Um, so um, there, there are multiple multiple perspectives that I'm going to try to, to get across. Um, part of this talk uh, is sort of independent of Humphrey homology. Um, I want to, in very, very broad strokes, recall some of the structures that should appear in 3D TQFT. Um, and I, I talked about some of these things a, a year and a bit ago um, in, in Kansas, I think in much more detail. Um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll just talk briefly about the ones I need. Um, so sort of part one of the talk um, um, is going to be some some structures in 3D TQFT. Um, and the TQFTs I have in mind um, are labeled, um, they're either sigma models or gauge theories. So in the case where they're sigma models, Um, physically, they would have a hyperkähler target, um, though many of the things I'll discuss don't require hyperkähler geometry and can just be understood algebraically. Um, so keeping the algebraic perspective for most of the talk, um, I'll say they have algebraic symplectic targets. Um, and so these are smooth algebraic symplectic varieties, um, which in a little more over, I uh, just take to be cotangent bundles. Um, or more interestingly, gauge theories um, with algebraic symplectic stacks as the target. So on the left-hand side, M is just a smooth variety. On the right-hand side, uh, the target as a stack is going to be the cotangent bundle of V mod G, where V is a linear, a complex linear algebraic representation of some algebraic reductive group G. Um, and as a stack, I point out this is the same thing as the symplectic quotient. Um, this is algebraic symplectic um, also for the not homology applications, I won't <laughs> I won't actually need to use the full stackiness. Um, it's only an open 
part of this, a smooth open part is relevant, but um, there's, a, there's a bigger story involved that does use the stacks. Um, so sorry, th this is the data that labels the 3D TKFTs I'm interested in, but uh, in addition, I need to talk a bit about of topological twists, and they are there are A or B twists of both sigma models and gauge theories, just like there are in, in two dimensions. People for decades have been studying this rich world of like two-dimensional Calabia sigma models and A and B twists. And it there is an analogous, very rich world in 3D, uh, only a small part of which has actually been explored so far. Um, so there are a and B twists of, of both of these. Um, so those are the theories I'm interested in. I want to talk about some categories associated to them. Um, and then I want to apply this to not homology. And so the, the story is that uh, Oblomkov and Rosansky Um, constructed or gave a proposal for Humphrey homology um, from the B twist of um, fundamentally. Uh, the theory, the gauge theory, where V is G of N crest C to the N and, and G is G of N. With, with a bunch of extra stuff that is going to know about knots and the knot is being presented as an N strand ray in this construction, which I'll, I'll try to review depending on how much time I have. Um, um, so this is something they, they did. Um, and from the beginning, Lev was inspired by 3D and 4D quantum field theory. Um, but then, uh, sort of stuff. Um, my collaborators and I have been doing the past few years um, is, is trying to understand um, 3D mirror symmetry um, and how it relates algebraic structures um, in mirror pairs of theories in three dimensions. Um, and it turns out that one can apply 3D mirror symmetry to every single object in the oblomkov rosansky construction and find a new proposal uh, for Humphrey homology in the A-twist. Um, and so far, there is a concrete and provably correct computation for um, positive algebraic knots. So al algebraic knots represented as, as positive braids. Um, and by, by what I mean by provably correct um, is that uh, this is um, equivalent uh, due to a result of my student, Nick Garner, and Eugene Gorski student, uh, Oscar Kivinen, no longer student now at Caltech, who I think is in the audience. Um, Uh, that this, the result of this eight twist calculation uh, is equivalent to um, uh, to a construction of uh, Gorski uh, Oblomkov. Um, Rasmussen and Shende. Um, 
um, using affine Springer fibers. Um, and it, it turns out that, well, so something it's, what comes out of the atrist is not exactly that. But you get cohomology, Borel Moore homology of some moduli space, uh, but it is with some manipulations uh, that that moduli space itself is equivalent to, to the affine Springer fiber that, um, that was studied by Gorski, Obronkov, Rasmus, and Schindler. Uh, yeah, and uh, Tudor, there was also some old work by um, Oblomkov, Rasmus, and Schindler without Gorski. And uh, the answer was given kind of in terms of Hilbert schemes. Uh, yes, so that also shows up. Um, okay, that, but, it's that's not, the, but it's not the, equivalent to. It, um, it, it, it ought to be. Um, there are Hilbert schemes on both the A side and the B side. So let me, okay. let me explain right now why. So given the data of here, uh, where the representation is the Lie algebra times C to the N, the group is GLN, um, the symplectic quotient is the Hilbert scheme, uh, or rather in an open part or a stable part um, is the Hilbert scheme. And then points on C2. Well, that's that's in the B twist. Um, but the mirror, this this particular theory is very special in that its 3D mirror is the same. Um, so the 3D mirror has exactly the same, the same data, but, but the computations are, are completely different. Um, and the way the knot is encoded looks completely different. Um, uh, so, so Hilbert schemes come up in both places. Um, and I'll say more, I'll say more during the rest of the talk, but yeah. Um, okay. So that's the plan. Um, I hope to get to at least some part of that. Um, let me let me get into some 3D TQFT structures. Um, so the main players here are going to be a, a category and a two category. Um, so any any 3D TQFT. Um, has a category which is called C of physically though they are bulk line operators um, and it's a braided tensor category um, and it's also in the sorts of theories I'm interested in that come about as topological twists. Um, this is a DG data tensor category and there's derived stuff everywhere that I'm, I'm going to be suppressing. Um, there, so this you should think of as like the, the, the 3D TQFT that many, many, many people are familiar with is Trent-Simons theory and line operators there form a braided tensor category. Um, and give rise to things like Jones polynomials. Um, so th this is the analog of that. Um, the way knots appear in this story is going to be very indirect. And, and so they, they do not, knots do not appear from braiding these line operators, um, though, they, though they could. Um, and there's some ongoing work by, by various groups on figuring out what sort of knot invariance one gets. Um, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about. Um, the other thing I should say maybe is that since I've been talking to Jan and Jan just gave some beautiful talks um, in another seminar about L infinity and A infinity algebras. So this category is analogous to uh, the E2 L infinity inside it uh, algebra 
um, oh, I can't spell, uh, in a 2D PQFT. In 3D, everything gets promoted one category level up. Um, so that's ingredient one. Ingredient two is a two category. Um, maybe of boundary conditions. Um, and this is analogous to uh, to be a infinity of PG. DTQFT. And then there are relations among C and B um, as, as that sort of categorify what one expects in two dimensions. Um, so in, in particular, um, uh, given any object, Um, and B uh, is a tensor category. And at this point, I should try to start introducing pictures. Um, so I always have in mind is the following thing. Um, objects in this two category label boundary conditions in a three-dimensional space locally um, and Endomorphisms of B um, are line operators uh, line operators stuck to that boundary, they're self interfaces, and they form a tensor category because two such things can collide, and that's the tensor product. Uh, and I could say things in terms of like what the TQFT assigns to various manifolds, but I think anyone who's interested in that can also figure it out. Um, um, so, so this thing is a tensor category. This is the analog of an A infinity algebra. the endomorphisms of some object of the category in 2D TQFT. Um, and then what can you do? Uh, there, there are two functors. Um, there's, I, I, they don't really have canonical names. Um, at least some folks uh, call one of these functors a categorical churn map uh, or churn character. Um, so given any object in this two category, there's a functor from end B to bulk lines. And there is also a functor going the other way. Uh, that Um, just given my background, I, I can only call it a boundary map. Um, that so let me let me work by analogy again. So in in, in two D TQFT, there's a map from the E two algebra to the center of the A infinity algebra on the boundary, and often one wants to think of the derived version of that. So there, there's a map from the E two algebra to Hochschild cohomology of these boundary A infinity algebras, uh, and th this is this is similar. Um, so, so really, the derived version of this map on the bottom is going to the derived center of this monoidal category. Um, but but there's an, there's a simpler version where I don't take Cockshield cohomology and I just just map into the center of this this monoidal category. Uh, are, are they joint? And and in one direction. Um, and it's it's really easy to see from pictures. Um, so so the picture for the top uh, 
um, so what is what does the churn map do? Uh, so it takes one of these boundary conditions of three-dimensional space and wraps it on a circle. So this is the S1 map. Um, and so you can imagine having a boundary condition B um, sort of wrapping an empty cylinder inside three-dimensional space. And from very, very far away, this, or everything's topologically, you just squeeze this empty cylinder down. It looks like a line operator in the bulk. Um, and my, my bulk line operators were literally lines in, in three-dimensional space. Um, and this looks like a line in three-dimensional space. This, this is the hand wavy physics explanation of why this map exists. Um, now, what is, what is it actually doing? I said it's a functor from endomorphisms of, endomorphisms of B to, uh, um, to bulk lines. So given an endomorphism of B, let's use blue, so call it L, that I can decorate this cylinder. So if I don't put any decoration at all on, there's actually, there's a canonical, sort of the equivalent of the identity. Um, there's, there's an I, I, uh, identity endomorphism. Um, but I can also choose something that's not the identity and just throw a line onto that cylinder. Um, so, so the claim is that this is now an object of bulk lines. And the, the other map uh, on the bottom, it's the bulk boundary map. It says take a bulk line operator, a line sitting in the bulk, and bring it, bring it onto the boundary. Um, and that tells you which direction these should be adjoints in. Um, so if we apply the churn map and then the bulk boundary map, so we're producing a little cylinder and then taking the cylinder and putting it back onto the same boundary and it just remerges and becomes part of the boundary again. Uh, and this should be the identity functor. Okay. Um, that's all I need, I think. Um, abstract TQFT stuff. Um, any, any questions? So if somebody had questions, just unmute yourself. And... Yeah, please. Oh, there is a question uh, in the chat. Uh, how do you define the map if B is not a cylinder? Um, So, um, more globally, one can sort of wrap a boundary condition on anything. Um, and so, in particular, one gets like pairs of pants and stuff like that. Uh, and so, that, um, that tells you that the sorts of objects in C that one gets from wrapping boundary conditions on cylinders locally are quite special. Um, they had better be algebra objects. Um, the ability to wrap on a pair of pants tells you that that there's a, there's an endomorph there's a hom from one object to the object tensor itself, um, and and it, like, as far as how, how you define it, you you. It depends what world you, you, you live in. Um, there's, there's a dual description of all of this where I could have said this is what the TQFT assigns to law sort of one manifold or two manifold. Um, and, uh, and then this is, this is all about cobordisms um, between various manifolds. Um, so I, I think there, there's some fancy TQFT way of saying all this. Um, at, at least my perspective so far has been to use expectations from fancy TQFT to actually get concrete descriptions of these things in actual field theories. Um, so I, I like 
I like examples and they're very rich. Um, and I, I, I don't know all the answers to that in, in actual theories. Um, but I know some of it and I'll tell you about it now. Can I ask, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in, in that adjunction you, you just showed, was yeah. that a, a unit or a co-unit map? It goes, it goes to the identity. Um, it's, uh, um may not be appreciating some things but uh take any object and uh well, no, take my any question, my question right? was just whether churn is is left adjoined to to row or row is left adjoined to churn or maybe it doesn't matter <laughs> no well i think um um so take any objects, apply churn, apply row, you get the same object back. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so it becomes- I, that, Yeah, naturally how to say it better. It becomes um, very, very interactive. There is also a question just probably last from Denis Aru. Uh, so it just probably kind of pedagogical for pedagogical uh, purposes that if you uh, kind of uh, uh, factor out one uh, dimension in 3D world uh, sheet, do you see just a 2D picture? It, it depends. So, so the answer is no. Um, like what, if factor out is not the right operation. Um, compactify one direction on s1 or on an interval then yes um so so there is an operation that that reduces the categor categorical level of everything here um which is make the third direction an interval or a circle um uh, otherwise when it's non-compact you you get you get this picture um uh, with, with everything categorified um Okay, I, maybe, I'm gonna sorry. Maybe, for Alex, maybe let's go on because you thanks know. for Alex. Let me give a reference. So um, there, there's a there's a paper by Blumkoff and Rosansky on churn characters and they they discuss these two maps um, okay. and and I think should should have all the appropriate language surrounding them. Okay. Thank um, you. Um, okay, and sorry, I don't have I don't have the chat up, and there are a few things to coordinate. So, so Jan, thank you for bringing up the questions. Please let please keep letting me know if things come up. Uh, um, so, um, um, so examples. Um, I talked about sigma models and gauge theories. Let me just tell you what these categories look like. Um, so, in Um, in a sigma model with target T star M, uh, in the B twist, which is algebraic and way easier, um, uh, the rated tensor category of bulk lines looks like coherent sheaves on T star M uh, with the braiding that was discussed. Um, initially by uh, Rosansky and Witten, and then by Kupust and uh, Rosansky and Salina. Um, that has to do with the Atiyah bracket, and then Kapranov and Kansevich have said things about this. Um, as a category, that's just coherent sheaves on, on the target. Um, and the yeah, this is something newer. Um, uh, this is the modules. On so for statement, this admits an algebraic description that's not a priori obvious. Uh, it's D modules on the algebraic loop space of them. This is one version of it. So define M over Laurent series. Um, take D modules on that. 
Um, um, so Jodor, I confused with the notation what this M with subindex because it is, as, as is a just formal, some variety. It's, it's not algebraic loops with values in, in M. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's it's the algebraic. I might be not writing it correctly, and it's, it's the algebraic loop space of M. Huh. So it's it's maps. Um, it's the mapping scheme from the formal punctured disk to M. Mm -hmm. um, and gauge theory, uh, where we're dealing with. Um, the full answer for the B category is fancy and complicated. Um, so, and just, some parts of it are just becoming concrete due to work of, of Justin Hilburn and, and Phil Seng Yu and Sam Raskin in, in the last year. Um, so the, the full answer seems to look um, like coherent sheaves on a space of G bundles uh, with flat sections of B on the formal punctured disk. Um, however, sitting inside here is a much smaller category uh, that is just coherent sheets on the stack. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, like the naive answer you might expect is coherent sheaves on the stack, but in, in, in fact, you can get much more, much, much more interesting structures. Um, and on the A side, it looks like what you might expect, um, uh, equivariant D modules. on the loop space of, of the emoji, um, which is, is something that might look scary, but is um, fully concrete and computable mathematically, um, unlike the B side in this case. Um, so uh, that's, that's our category C. Um, and then we had a two category. Um, and Limited things are known about this two category. Kapustin, Rosansky, Salina described some parts of it in the B twist of sigma models. Um, um, in either twist, it has um, some geometric, nice objects that probably form the heart of some sort of T structure, but I do not know. Um, it has objects labeled by um, a variety Z um, and a superpotential that's a map in the sigma model case from B times C to C, and then the gauge theory case. Um, in the sigma model, it's n times z to c. In the gauge theory case, it's v times z to c. Uh, and it should be g invariant. So that's for gauge theory. Um, and uh, Homs between these, Homs among these objects are well understood, at least, or at least in the, on the b side, um, and much less so on the a side. Um, uh, so in the B twist, uh, let me just do endomorphisms of this object labeled by a variety and a superpotential. Um, this was Kapustin Rosansky's Salina. Um, looks like matrix factorizations on two copies of Z and one copy of M with the superpotential potential 
that's the difference of the superpotentials involving the two copies of Z. Um, and in gauge theory, it's just the equivariant version of this. So that's sigma model and in gauge theory. Um, it's G equivariant matrix factorizations on and Z cross V cross C. Um, in, so note, this is a monoidal category. Um, so the tensor product comes from convolution. Um, there's the, the relevant convolution diagram involves one copy of M and three copies of Z and you, you ignore one of the copies of Z and push and pull. Um, and the super potentials add up appropriately. Um, on the A side, um, this is mainly work in progress. Um, so the naive answer uh, is that one should get a Fukai Seidel category uh, of the same type. Um, an equivariant Fukai Seidel category, whatever that is in the, in the gauge theory case. Um, the problem is that even in simple examples, it becomes quickly clear that this is too naive. In particular, it does, it's not compatible with 3D mirror symmetry. Um, and so one needs to include some higher version of wrapping to, to even have a chance. Um, uh, I think this is an awesome area to try to say something more about in, in the next few years. Uh, um, what means higher, higher wrapping? In what sense higher? You have several. So in, in the following sense. So if you're intersecting Lagrangians in, a, in an ordinary, if you're in an ordinary Fukaya category and you want to know a hom between two Lagrangians and they're non-compact, there's a wrapped version of that Fukaya category uh, that I think tilts one of them and considers intersections at infinity. Um, and in order to match across ordinary mirror symmetry, one actually needs to include those sorts of intersections uh, or do other things to the B side. Um, here, um, this is, I, I haven't said the word Lagrangian, maybe the other way to say it, this data of a super potential on M cross Z actually defines by its graph uh, a Lagrangian in T star M. Um, and, and so these are holomorphic, another way that I could have said this is that boundary conditions are labeled by holomorphic Lagrangians in T star M with some additional data, um, sort of vibrations of 2D theories over Lagrangians. But geometrically, you can ask, look, look simple ones, if I just have a function on M, I get a Lagrangian in T star M, um, what is HOM between those? I expect a category. And the same sort of feature seems to arise in that you don't, you don't just get one category like from a single intersection point, but like you have to take these holomorphic Lagrangians and intersect them multiple times and get like a sort of a tower of a tower of categories. Um, I can make that precise in the simplest abelian examples, and um, not entirely sure how to make it precise in other uh, more interesting cases. But that, so, that, but that's the sort of thing that, that has to arise somehow. But uh, you, have, you, you see only holomorphic Lagrangians, yeah? Yes. Um, uh, I do. And it might, again, be the case that they're actually forming, uh, like they're generating the category, and maybe there could be something else. Um, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, I, yeah, 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 I understand. Sort of like, for example, like perverse shifts in 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 all constructible. This is, this is exactly yeah. It's exactly why I was asking you questions last time. Okay. Um, yeah, awesome. Okay, so that's the setup. Um, I want to now 
tell you why it applies to knot homology and I'll I will attempt to be sketchy on the details um, just to keep this finite time. Um, so not homology on the B side. And so what I'm telling you now is all in the papers of Oblomkov and Rosansky. Okay, a series of papers over the last five years or so. Um, it's also very closely related to uh, work of Gorski, Nagutz, and Rasmussen. Um, and involving Israel bimodules. Rather than convolution categories of matrix factorizations, when one seems to end up in the same place. Um, and these ergo bimodules should be appearing in, in 3D gauge theories. Um, don't know quite precisely how yet, but it is largely for lack of trying. Um, so, um, so what's the goal? Um, so Humphrey homology given a link, which for me will always be the closure of a braid. So that, that information does not go into Humphrey polynomials or homology. Um, Humphrey P homology or triply graded homology. Um, so this is a theory that was actually predicted in physics in um, work of Stenfield, Gukov, and, and Rasmussen uh, based on conifold constructions and string theory initially stemming from Oguri Vafa. Uh, and the story I'm going to tell you is also linked to the Oguri Vafa construction of the conifold um, in ways that I will not have time to discuss. Um, but what, what does complete PT homology give you? Um, is so this is a sequence, it's a finite sequence of z graded dg vector spaces it's called hk uh, where the z grading um, I'll refer to as q and then there's another there's a homological grading on the DG side. The, the Z grading I'm talking about is, is not homological. Um, uh, and they obey various nice properties that are not coportisms. Um, but in particular, um, the, uh, the sum of graded Euler characters Uh, with little q um, counting the big Q degree, um, supposed to be the Humphrey polynomial, uh, which is polynomial, or depending on how you normalize it, possibly rational, um, in, in A and Q of our link. So the goal is to produce these spaces, these spaces HK. Um, a beautiful feature of this is that um, everything breaks up into different A degrees. Um, and I should also say this, this thing was defined um, mathematically uh, by uh, Kovanov and Rosansky. Um, okay, so um, so how do you pull it out from 3D theory? There are three ingredients involved. Um, one takes, as we said at the beginning, um, the gauge theory 
with vector space uh, GLN times C to the end. I'll think of this that is parameterized by matrices X and vectors I, um, and the group is GLN. The symplectic quotient contains the Hilbert scheme. Um, and there is a C star action here that rotates X um, that that gives the Q grading. It induces the Q grading on, on various things. Um, okay, well, that's certainly not enough information to, to talk about a knot or a braid. Um, so we're also going to introduce a boundary condition, which is an object of this two category uh, that was defined by a variety and a superpotential. And so the variety here is T star flag for GLN. Um, and the superpotential um, is trace of R coordinate X on the Lie algebra times the moment map um, on the moment map for. GLN on T star flag. Um, then uh, using what I said before, endomorphisms of the C and W looks like matrix factorizations, GLN equivariants on two copies of T star flag, GLN, C to the N. with a superpotential that's trace of x times the difference of moment maps on the two copies of the flag variety. Um, and so this is one of the starting points that you see in the actual papers of, of, of Blankoff and Rosansky. Um, and the claim, that theorem, <laughs> Um, um, is that there's um, there's a categorical representation of the braid group on n strands um, inside of this category. Um, in other words, there are objects in this matrix factorization category for any sort of crossing. Um, and, and this is a tensor category from convolution on, on the flag varieties. Um, and that convolution product is precisely composition of, of braid generators. Um, uh, so in particular braids beta give us objects in this category. Um, and there's one last ingredient. So, so far you actually know enough um, to start encoding a knot, uh, but we need to know something about a degree. And so the final ingredient um, is a bulk line operator. Um, in the category that I said in the B twist of a gauge theory, this category looks sort of horrendous. There's a, there's a Duram model for it that involves flat connections on a punctured disc, but there's, there's a very small piece and the, everything lands in that small piece here. Um, so uh, the bulk, category of line operators is coherent sheaves on the Hilbert scheme, uh, at least the, the nice, the nice non-stacky piece of it, um, where this is T star V or G stable. Um, okay, so 
So what, we, what can we conclude then from all of the abstract TCST structure? Um, and the churn character map, sorry, for any braid data, which is an object of NZW, uh, churn character beta is going to be a coherent sheaf, at least if it lands in this nice small category, and it does. Uh, is going to be a coherent sheaf on the Hilbert scheme. Um, and it only depends um, or rather, sorry, it's it's in, in, it's it's cyclically invariant. Um, so it's invariant under Markov one. Um, and then Humphrey homology HK, so the A to the K part of Humphrey homology. Uh, this, is, this is the proposal. Uh, is that the kth part of Humphrey homology is just hum of the turn character map applied to the sprayed and Oh, I didn't tell you what this line operator was. Uh, this is just um, the case exterior power of the tautological bundle on the Hilbert scheme. Um, or if you go upstairs to T star V, uh, just take the fundamental representation of GLN and K exterior powers of that, um, and, then, and then push it down to, to the quotient. Um, right. So that's so that's that, um, and then you can try to compute um, and theorem. This is Markov two invariant, and it only depends on on the braid closure. So it gives you some sort of not invariant, and that's supposed to be Humphrey homology. Um, okay, um, that's the B side. Um, this is one way of computing things, and I feel like I should really draw, should really draw a picture. Um, so, so what is this actually doing? Um, so, we're taking a boundary condition, the one labeled by by this specific choice of Z and W, T star flag, um, and the picture I always have in mind looks like this. So we have our Hilbert scheme sigma model uh, in sort of the center of the cylinder. And, and uh, then we have a boundary condition labeled by T star flag with this W. Um, and there are a bunch of endomorphisms of this boundary condition. And endomorphisms of this boundary condition are generators uh, are crossings in a braid. Um, and so they sort of abstractly represent some sort of, well, they, they, they represent uh, little pieces of a braid. Um, and as we go around the cylinder, we actually end up with the closure of a braid. And so this going around the cylinder is, is precisely applying this churn character map. Um, then there's a bulk line operator that goes in the center, which is labeled by the tautological bundle. And in this picture, HK is the Hilbert space. of the B-twisted 3D theory on this cylinder. So we, we have a configuration that's constant in time. We can compute a vector space from that. And that, that's what this categorical computation is doing. It is, it is producing for us this Hilbert space. 
Um, and the beautiful thing is that there are other ways to do it. There's, there's initially Oblonka and Rosnowski used some categorical trace that didn't require the turn character map, but there, there are many ways to get to the same answer. Um, okay. Um, right, good. I still have four minutes left. Um, yeah, you can you can go over time. It's it will go very briefly over time, and anyone is welcome to leave. Um, let me let me just try to describe the three D mirror of everything, if, if that's mm -hmm. if that's okay, and then I'll, I'll I can expand on anything and, and take take questions. Um, thanks. Um, so, all right. So this is the new part. Um, a twisted mirror. So there were three ingredients that were important here. There was the data of this symplectic stack. There was a boundary condition, some variety in a superpotential. And there was this extra bulk line operator that kept track of a degree. And each of these quite beautifully turns out to have a well-known mirror. Um, and in physics, the mirrors all come from brain constructions. Um, and this is the black box of string theory. Um, to express everything in type 2b string theory, apply type 2b s duality, get back to field theory, and you get an answer. And then you can, um, you can try to check that the answer makes sense. Um, so, so here's the answer. Um, so the mirror of the mirror of the Hilbert scheme is the Hilbert scheme, um, and this was known back from the early days of three mirror symmetry in the nineties. Um, uh, the mirror of the boundary condition has not really been discussed, but it is not terribly difficult to to just work out. Um, um, turns out um, that um, so also I should say I'm putting like shrieks on lots of objects to express dual. These duals are not independent of each other. Like really, it's the pair V and G that has a dual, and then it's not like the variety Z has a dual by itself. It's the variety Z acting as a boundary condition for this particular bulk theory has a dual. Um, like in particular, this is not 2D mirror symmetry. Um, so the right thing to put here is the group manifold. Um, and, or physically, this is a Dirichlet boundary condition. Um, and there's an interesting super potential. Um, so to define W, we have to choose. Um, some data. So one is going to be a vector of ones, um, and lambda is going to be a diagonal matrix with distinct eigenvalues. Let me write down the model, and then I'll, I'll try to explain why this is a reasonable mirror. Um, so. Um, and then the mirror W looks like this. So it goes from GLN cross C to the N cross G to C. We call coordinates on those XI and little g. Um, and it ends up looking like it's a thing. Um, trace of x times the g conjugate of lambda uh, plus, and if you're unhappy about the order that things appear here, um, it's whatever order is required for this to be g invariant. Uh, where g acts on g, it's on the left. Um, okay, um, so 
Um, let me talk about some features of this. So, so first in the in the B on the B side, let me go back to this picture. Um, so I said very abstractly that there is supposed to be a representation of the braid group in this category of endomorphisms of, of the boundary condition, in this category of matrix factorization. That's very abstract. There's um, if you forget about algebraic geometry for a second and I think in terms of Kähler geometry, this actually makes much more sense. T star flag has a bunch of Kähler parameters. Um, it has a vector of uh, n minus one complexified Kähler parameters. Um, there's, there's an extra one coming in from the bulk Hilbert scheme, um, but I don't think it's actually important. Sorry. So we just want the T star flag Kähler parameters. Um, they, they're complexified um, the usual way that they are in two-dimensional theories. Um, and the B model doesn't depend on them. So like from the boundary perspective, this is like we have a, just a two-dimensional B model on the boundary. It's just getting coupled to stuff in the bulk as well. If we just knew that we had a B model to T-star flag, um, in the Kähler description of this, um, there are these resolution parameters they're, they get complexified and they can be braided around each other in a way that is locally constant. And that, that is what should be happening here. Um, so, so physically, I would say that at each of these little interfaces on the boundary, the Kähler parameters just swap and move around each other in a particular way. Um, and what Oblomkov and Rosansky did was to identify objects in this matrix factorization category that encode these very fast swaps. Um, as far as I know, there's like mathematically this braiding of Kähler parameters or how the B model actually depends on Kähler parameters has not been made precise. Um, like there, there are these sort of discrete um, automorphisms or jumps, but, but everything ought in principle to be continuous. Um, Anyway, this is in, in Kähler geometry, this is how braiding should be appearing. Um, and so what's happening on the A side, here, um, is that these lambdas occurring in the eigenvalues of this matrix, which enters the superpotential, um, so these are the mirrors of boundary Kähler parameters. Um, they have to be held distinct, or rather it's their differences that are the mirrors of boundary Kähler parameters. Um, they have to be held distinct and they're going to be describing for us the positions of n strands of a braid in C. Um, and as we go around the cylinder, we can start moving them around each other. And in the, in the A twist, it's actually possible to do that continuously and explain what happens. Um, okay, um, the part that is most interesting and that I can't say too much about yet is what end of this boundary condition is. So this is the thing that should have a representation of the braid group on n strands. Uh, best guess uh, is that it's a Fukai Saito category um, on um, GLN cross C to the N cross G uh, with a certain super potential that I'm not gonna write down because I'm running out of time. Um, um, this has objects. So if you do the usual Fukai's I don't think and ask like, what are the critical points of the super potential and what's the order on them? Uh, this beautifully has objects related to uh, labeled by crossings. Um, and and they're sort of in the right order to match matrix factorizations or circled by modules, but um, a lot has not been computed here. Um, this is work in progress. Should be fun. Um, however, one can jump past that for the moment. Um, and actually do some things without knowing 
this category explicitly. Um, the, the mirror of the thing that counted a degree um, is an object in bulk lines. Bulk lines is D modules on the loop space of D mod G. Um, and this is uh, this is a beautiful, simple thing. Um, so this is the structure sheaf of um, the space where x. Um, so x is going to be our GLN matrix, and i is going to be our vector um, x. Um, has a simple pole, sorry, a simple zero uh, in its top k columns, k rows, and is regular in the bottom n minus k rows, and i is just regular. Um, so it's this modulo an appropriate parahoric. Uh, subgroup of GLN. Um, now, so the, everything is sitting inside Taylor series. Um, and this, so it's, one can take a structure sheaf of roughly it's Taylor series sitting inside Laurent series and then push it, push it down to, to the stack and uh, think of that as, as a D module. Um, so what I've given you, if we don't think about quotients, is a D module on uh, to an D module. Sorry, to Mike. Um, great. So uh, in particular, when k is zero. L zero is just the structure sheaf of the arc space pushed down to, to the loop space. Um, awesome. Um, so that's the nice thing with that track, but now everything has about to become very confusing. Um, um, so yeah, how do we actually compute anything? Um, um, so we can do it for algebraic knots. Um, and there's a technical restriction that Things about um, clear white stare, but I don't know how to overcome it. Um, there's there's some positivity condition on on the crossings. Um, so um, so how am I going to compute this thing for algebraic knots? I don't actually know what the two category looks like because this Fukayasaito category is kind of complicated. It shouldn't be that bad as a category, but as, as a tensor category with convolution on G, it's not, it doesn't look especially pleasant and it is outside my realm of, of expertise at the moment. Um, but what if, so we, we don't, the point is we don't actually need to know that um, to do something. Um, the image of the churn character map for algebraic knots uh, is easy to describe. Um, so let um, closure beta uh, be an algebraic link. Um, in other words, uh, beta looks like uh, the intersection of a very small 
um, S3 uh, and a plane curve singularity. Um, and I would usually have used Z rather than T here. Um, it's one supposed to be a formal parameter and one is an actual coordinate. You know, they're playing the same ball. Um, so there's a plane curve singularity in C2. It's being intersected with a tiny S3. Um, um, and then we can choose um, an element in n by n matrices of the round series spectral curve um, is this polynomial giving us the plane curve singularity. This is a, a standard thing. Um, um, the claim is that once we apply the churn character map, uh, to this object of endomorphisms inside this two category, um, endomorphisms of this boundary condition. Um, so this is supposed to land in D modules on the loop space of V mod G, um, and it's just the skyscraper D module on X is X of T. And I is the vector of ones in the modules on um, the space I've been talking about. Uh, and so again, uh, one needs to push this thing forward to uh, to the quotient. Um, and then you just sort of push through a computation. Um, so um, so the fact that this is the object in the category of bulk lines that should correspond to the closure of a braid um, also comes from some Hilbert space analysis. Uh, or it's the analysis of what this boundary condition wrapped on a circle looks like when, when the, the lambda parameters start braiding around, which are eigenvalues of this matrix X. Um, um, and then you can you compute. So K Hom's the homology is supposed to be Hom in this D module category between the term multiplied to beta and Um, and that line operator accounting for k degree, um, and by the end of Chris and Ginsburg, this is Pharrell Moore homology of a certain moduli space. Um, it's just the space of G in the loop group. Uh, with some with some restrictions. Um, such that when we apply G to X of T, we, so, so there are going to be relations that relate the link, the data of this link to the data of the line operator LK. Um, and so when we apply G to X of T, we have to land in the this particular form a modification of the R space um, and G applied to I, uh, G applied to the specter of ones, really written as a column vector should land in The end. 
Um, and so it's this modulo, isom modulo isomorphism. So there, there's some parahoric that, that acts as isomorphisms of this data. Um, and, okay, and that's, I, I find that surprisingly concrete um, at the end of this talk. Um, somewhere one can actually do something. Um, and then there's the theorem I mentioned at the beginning uh, that in fact, this moduli space is an affine Springer fiber um, and, um, and is exactly the thing that um, Gorski, Oplankov, Rasmussen, and Chende looked at um, some years ago. Um, okay. And, and that's the end. And sorry to have gone over time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so now it's time for questions. All right. Yeah, I, I do have some, but probably uh, first uh, kind of participants should go ahead with, with the questions. So you just unmute yourself and ask Tudor. Oh, there, sorry, there are a bunch in the chat, sorry. Yeah, there are ma many questions in the chat, but probably it's faster if people just unmute themselves and ask. I mean, we are not as strict and in this Western Hemisphere seminar when you can speak only if you are allowed by <laughs> by, <laughs> by <Roman Antonini. laughs> Yeah, all right. So uh, we, we are more democratic. So uh, mm. I, I, wanna, I have a question about these uh, lines L, L sub k that you defined and L sub k uh, shriek. Yep. So is, is there a way of producing L sub k for a different k with uh, let's say L1 or can, can you braid them? Um, so yes. <laughs> Uh, one, one should be able to braid them. I think that leads to a, um, sorry, one can definitely braid them. It, it leads to a different sort of not invariant, if, if that's what you're I see, because in, on, on, on the B side, you said uh, the LK was something related to, to K uh, wedge power of, uh, so imagine yeah. if you you could do like uh, some sort of braiding you can do. Yeah, I'm sorry, I left a lot of things as black boxes. So, so that's right. So, um, there's so in 3D, one has transcendence, and then one can look at A and B twisted gauge theories or sigma models or some admixture of both. So, um, uh, Kapust and Salina wrote about, um, a mixed transcendence Rosansky written theory. Um, so yeah, totally. Um, I, I think one gets some, um, probably some, somewhat. Um, one gets Rosansky written invariants in this case. Uh, I think everything reduces to the Hilbert scheme, and um, if we're we're talking about line, um, we're talking about vector bundles on. On the Hilbert scheme, their, their exterior powers of the tautological bundle, mm -hmm. um, and the sorts of invariants one would produce are are precisely Rosansky written invariants. I see. Um, uh, but if just as a point, um, so if you use three D theory and braiding of lines, um, you're not going to categorify anything. Um, the best you can hope for is is some sort of number. Um, like to, to get a link, you, you, you don't just want to braid, you need to like either fix the endpoints or close them up or, or something like that. And then that, that's gonna give you numbers. Um, the reason we were getting, the reason we can get homology in this case is that the braiding is actually happening in some other direction. And if we had lifted up the string theory, that, that direction would have been manifest. Um, and, and we're keeping one direction in 3D totally constant so that we can pull a vector space out. Um, like once you use all three directions, you, you can't get vector spaces anymore. 
Okay, uh, so uh, more questions? Oh, I, okay. I know this is still around. So, so you had asked in the chat about um, the, the yeah. trimap landing in the smaller category. Um, so I think probably the answer is no. So, so what's actually happening is that um, for this entire construction, the Hilbert scheme is getting resolved. Um, or rather, the, the, the stack, there's, there's actually a stability parameter that's being introduced in, in T star V mod G. Um, and I, I think once you introduce that stability parameter, the, the really big fancy DRAM category um, should just map to, um, to the small category of sheaves on the Hilbert scheme, um, because that is the better way to say it. Um, and I remember correctly, there's, it, in terms of, yeah, sorry, um, it, it, it's analogous to what happens in math when um, you just have you just have an algebraic quotient, not not symplectic, and and consider the coherent sheaves on the stack versus coherent sheaves on on a stable part. Uh, the some objects need to be thrown out, and then there's 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 an app to the category on this new thing. I think it is analogous to that, except you start with something really gigantic and then you end up with something small. Uh, Okay, uh, Tudor, I have also a question, uh, kind of a couple of them. So first, is there any uh, um, sort of uh, algebra of infrared description of this Foucault as I did? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there absolutely should be. Um, there are a few differences in that. Sorry, no, there, there totally should be. The, the target is not linear. Um, in algebra of the infrared, it was always a super potential on some linear space, but it shouldn't matter too much. Um, yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, also, the super potential has isolated critical points. Sorry, that that's maybe the thing I should say. Um, and and so absolutely. Um, The, the thing that algebra of the infrared doesn't give you is the convolution product. Um, so the, this Foucault-Seidel category, like it's very roughly, it's a Foucault category on the group manifold, thought of as a Kähler space. Um, mm. and, and Foucault on the group manifold has a convolution product coming from multiplication on G. Yeah, but uh, it's a standard story with this E2 structure. It's like if you have uh, pi one of the group, you have two operations, one coming from pi one in general from fundamental group and the other one from the group G. So this is how E2 structures appear. Yeah. So uh, since you mentioned this E2, <laughs> yeah, no, okay. Yeah, the analogy yeah. was E2 at the very beginning here. So the, the, answer, the answer should be yes, it would be, it would be really neat to to work it out. Um. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and I have sort of a question. Uh, uh, elementary. Uh, the, you mentioned that there is or there should be a relation to this Oblomkov, Rasmus, and Shende or Oblomkov, Shende, without yeah. Rasmus and story that it should be the same, or uh, or what? It. It. it I, it is the same, and if Oscar is still around, he can comment on that. Yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. Uh, yeah, because you see, uh, it's not my question, it's just the first part. But the uh, second part is that the, there was, for algebraic notes, this um, uh, uh, three Calabiao description, indeed, in terms of the resolved conifold. That's um, yeah. what totally. we did with the Manuelia. Uh, uh, and so this story is also related to that. Um, and it comes from compactifying on, uh, on a circle in the conifold. Um, so these, I'm gonna give you physics words. So, um, so the resolved conifold, there's a Lagrangian corresponding to the knot 
and and then one looks at holomorphic disks yeah, yeah. Um, that that end on that um, yeah that's also that, relation on the, on the to Arguri buffer which you mentioned yeah exactly so in the end theory version there's an extra direction um, and uh, and so these holomorphic disks are actually M2 brains. Um, oh, sorry, they were, it depends what side you're on. It, but yeah, in the M theory version, these holomorphic disks are M2 brains and they actually have an extra time direction. And it's these holomorphic disks that are literally the cylinders I was drawing. Um, so like this solid cylinder with, um, with a knot around the outside, um, is going to end up being the theory on these M2 brains that has been compactified down to type 2A in a different way. But uh, if you imagine that you describe a knot as a very tight braid, so you think of it as many, many copies of the unknot that, that are just braiding around each other very finely, mm -hmm. um, then these holomorphic disks are, going, are just going to wrap um, n times when they're n braid strands. Um, and so one expects to get something like a rank N gauge theory on these brains. Um, and that's exactly what we have here. We, we, have, we have a GLN, algebraically, we have a GLN gauge theory um, with the data of the knot um, like sitting on the boundary. Um, to actually get to this gauge theory description, one has to, one thinks locally, say near the North Pole of the conifold, uh, one can think of the space very roughly as tau nut times C. Um, and then one compactifies on the fibers of C. Um, or, sorry, the, sorry the, the C times C vibration over, over P1. Near the North Pole, one compactifies on one of the copies, on, on, on an S1 sitting inside a copy of C. So where did um, you put your curve? From and the curve is in the other is in the other factor. I'm glad though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the curve survives. Um, and this thing worked out carefully. Actually, uh, pr produces some brain construction that that precisely replicates this entire setup. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, like like the the T star flag comes from these Lagrangian brains. Um, it, it, it produces the B-side of the setup. The T-star flag comes from the Lagrangian brains. The Hilbert scheme comes from the disks. Um, the, li the line operator in the middle of the tautological bundle comes from the P1 in the conifold. Um, Is there um, a for this? Like, it, it sounds like this explains, so like in this 3D story, you can sort of take arbitrary gauge group, you can throw the vector representation away, like, it seems a lot of this 3D mirror symmetry stuff there makes sense for other reductive groups, but this relation to yeah. the uh, conifold only makes sense in type A, where you kind of mix these numbers and an infinity. So. Uh, you, you cannot do it for, for AD, like replacing your resolved conifold for something. Like I mean, maybe you can, but like, I think what Tudor was just explaining is that the choice of this braid representative um, gives you the gauge theory. Um, so. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so it's sorry, tied like, up to GLN. Yeah, it's okay. It's tied into GLN. Like there, there might be generalizations of this that involve oriented folds or, or such, and in, in, in the string hmm. theory that give you some other version. But I, I think like to, to actually get dot homology, it, it's GLN. Oh, I'm happy with GLN. Yeah. So that's... Uh, okay, uh, so uh, more questions, comments, or whatever. I, I, I don't hear any. All right. Uh, well, um, thank you, Tudor, for really exciting talk i mean <laughs> at least for me I mean, it's it's incredible yeah, yeah it's so, like, sorry sorry i tried to cram in a, a bit too much yeah okay um, will you email me yes your, your notes and we'll post them together with with the video of your talk yeah absolutely i'll, I'll do that now
Uh, okay, uh, well, thank you very much again. Yeah. And I sure. hope okay. your lot, yeah. paper yeah, thanks will thanks appear you. soon. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Got to, got to move first. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. So, yeah. this is yeah. the end. Mm -hmm.